Okay, well, I think I'll get started. My name is Tamara Metz, um, and I am an associate professor of uh, political science and humanities. And I'm also the um, director of Reed's Center for Teaching and Learning. So um, we know that you have a lot of questions about um, the start of the fall semester, and this panel um, hopes to answer some of those. Um, and I'm going to be facilitating today, and I'm joined by four of my colleagues. I'll let them introduce themselves um, and then ask them to say a few words each about how they plan to maintain the rich learning experience um, for which Reed is known in these unprecedented times. Um, if you have any questions, you should just send them to me directly using the chat function on Zoom. And uh, I will draw from there uh, after my colleagues introduce themselves and say a few words about teaching at Reed. Um, and we're gonna aim to wrap up at about 1.55. Um, if we're unable to answer your questions, you should just email me at um, readctl, that's R-E-E-D-C-T-L at read.edu. Um, and just a word that or uh, note that today's session is being recorded so that we can share this information with the Reed community members who are not able to join us today. Okay, so panelists, um, if you could introduce yourselves, share your name, um, your title and division, pronouns if you're inclined, and also if you could tell us what you will be teaching or how you will be teaching in the fall that is online, hybrid, or in person. Um, just to get us started, that would be great. So I am going to move around my screen uh, and I'm gonna start with Jerry Andrzak uh, from the art department. Hi everyone, I'm Geraldine Andrzak and I teach in the art department. I teach studio art primarily. And I will be teaching in a hybrid fashion this semester, which means that I will be both in person and doing Zoom conferences. Crazy. Okay, Chris Kosky. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Kosky. I'm in the political science department, same as Tamara. I also teach in the environmental studies program. Um, this semester, I'll be teaching one class that's entirely in person and another class that's similar to what Jerry just described, a, a hybrid format. Great, uh, Kate. Duffley. Hi, my name is Kate Duffley. I teach in the theater department. Um, uh, this semester I will be teaching online. I'm teaching an acting course and a directing course and both of those will be primarily online with some in-person options for students uh, in our uh, rehearsal spaces. And Kara. Hi, I'm Kara Servany and I'm in the biology department. Uh, which is a math and natural sciences division. And this semester I'll be teaching in our introductory topics course, as well as teaching an upper level seminar in developmental neurobiology. And both of those courses are taught in the hybrid model. So some online components and some in-person components. Thank you. And I'm just struck um, and uh, I hope uh, the parents and folks watching are struck by the um, what a wide variety of both um, of, of uh, sorry of uh, of um, what what sorts of material are being taught in uh, online hybrid and in person and and the kind of creativity that even in this brief introduction we've seen um, so these are really strange times we're living in um, and they have radical implications for college life. So to my panelists, I wanted, I asked, um, I'd like to hear from you about what you see as the key challenges um, and opportunities uh, um, of teaching in this new environment and to hear a little bit about what you are gonna be doing to foster the inclusive and rigorous intellectual um, engagement that Reed is known for um, in your classes this semester. So um, why don't we just start uh, with Jerry, where we uh, started with before. So Jerry. You're... Thanks, Tamara. Uh, I would agree the challenges are many. However, mm -hmm. 
think in studio in the history and theory courses in the division of the arts and other fields, many of us have taken on the new media platforms and creative ways to really emphasize the digital. And in most of our courses, we'll be instructing using synchronous and asynchronous methods, both in person and online. We'll be using Moodle as our main hub and Ensemble as a video and audio platform. Students will have pre-recorded PowerPoints with voiceovers, demonstration videos, short lectures, or films to watch prior to class. In some cases, we'll be using Watch Together, which is a viewing platform in which you can uh, comment and view something in real time. We'll then gather after that viewing session and discuss that on Zoom and respond to each other's comments on Moodle. For the studio classes, we spent the summer making over 40 demonstration videos and packing kits for those students working at home and in the studio. If they're coming into the studio, they will be familiar with the tools and materials before they come to class so we can be socially distant while they're working. The studios have all been set up so students have their own workstation that nobody else will use. Um, they are, many are choosing to work from home and so the Zoom sessions will also be open during the entire time. Uh, the studio-based classes, we're teaching them to use many new digital tools, and this has been an amazing opportunity to do that. Uh, normally, we wouldn't use as many. They'll be using Adobe Suite, some video programs in order to do their critiques. Uh, I will be teaching them Google SketchUp Pro, an architectural drafting program, and we're using a Glowforge laser and a 3D Potterbot printer for ceramics. So they can remotely design and then have things cut here. To form community, we'll be meeting class individually and also assigning them to interview each other to make podcasts about their homes and their life experiences that will connect to their body of work. And then they'll also be making films to show their work to each other that will focus on the process rather than the product. Um, this moment is also an amazing opportunity for all of us because of Zoom to bring in visit scholars and artists that we would never have imagined bringing. My class, I'm bringing an architect, Lena Menard, who will help us with designing and building models for homeless people in the city of Portland. Nareet Barshar, an artist and biologist from Israel, will be speaking on the structures she studies and photographs. And Puerto Rican artist Roberto Lugo, who has made memorial teapots to people who have been killed by police violence, will join material objects. And then finally, I wanted everyone to know at the college that a group of us in the arts are working together to foster community. And we're making a virtual performing arts center, essentially a website in which people will be able, will be invited to live exhibition openings, performances, lectures, concerts, and they can log in afterwards to the archived events. Um, so pandemic or not, I think the, that platform alone will be amazing. and certainly will stay at Reed for a long time. So if you have any questions about any of that, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, put those into the chat and then we will um, follow up with you. With, we'll use the chat questions um, for a, a discussion after this. Um, that, that um, the way that you're bringing this very uh, embodied um, discipline into this new environment um, is impressive. And I, I think that the connection actually to what's happening, what, what happens in a, in a biology lab is, um, strikes me as a kind of relevant connection. So maybe um, we'll move to Kara and hear about um, her answer to that question. Sure, yeah. So I think there are a lot of similarities between the arts and the sciences in terms of the embodiment in which we hone our craft. And um, so in, the, in biology in particular, we've spent the summer um, outfitting our spaces so that our labs can be safe for students to work in. We figured out um, ways in which we can have socially distanced lab, which means that we've added more sections of labs, um, both to our upper division courses and to our introductory level courses so that we have fewer students in the lab at any given time. Um, we're really fortunate that we have enough equipment that everyone will have their own setup. Everyone will have their own compound microscope, their own dissecting microscope, um, their own pipetters, um, and other tools that they're going to need to perform the experiments that they're, they're going to be doing in lab. Um, this is the same um, in other science disciplines. I know in physics, they've actually um, kind of taken 
department and have put together of kits that they're sending to students who are unable to be on campus for and they're having synchronous labs where people are building their various circuit boards and testing amplifiers and other kinds of equipment that they're building. Um, chemistry is doing a lot of new and innovative things by using a lot of simulations. So instead of having students wait in line to use one piece of really expensive piece of equipment, they've actually simulated exactly what the student would do and have been focusing a lot more on data analysis. And that's something else we're doing in biology as well as focusing um, a lot more of our attention on data analysis and working with students um, in a variety of online platforms um, to do that. Um, like Jerry said, Moodle will be our home base as well. And so all of our classes have Moodle landing pages um, that are linked to a variety of outside sites. Um, we've used this time as an opportunity to really think about how we can embrace technology differently than we have in the past. And one of the things that we're doing um, a number of us are doing, especially in the intro level courses, is we're making a number of instructional videos that are not going to only be useful now, but will be useful for us in the future about how to use various microscopes and different kinds of equipment that often is something that I, I do and I repeat myself a million times. And now I can push that content out to students and they can watch it. And then they have questions when they come instead of having to think of their questions um, as I'm demonstrating. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so I think the other thing I wanted to say too is that I think we're using this also as a time to think about what's really special about READ and how we can preserve the connections and the individualized uh, programs that we provide for students. And one of the things that's really integral, at least for me, and I think many of my colleagues in the sciences, is the, the thesis and research experiences that our students get. And so we're making every effort um, both to provide in-person and um, remote options for thesis. And the remote options, we had a little bit of a test run last spring. And so we could prepare much better for those now. So I've spent the summer actually collecting a lot of data um, and not sleeping very much um, and generating data that my students are actually gonna be able to analyze those who aren't able to be in person. Um, and then also developing new projects. Um, I study eye development, I should have said that in the beginning, um, for students to work on in the lab when those students are able to be in person. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, this, this question of how, again, I'm, um, I'm struck by both the using this um, moment and the kind of what strike us at first as these severe challenges given that we're such, I mean, part of what we do is this high touch in person. I mean, that's like the heart of our education in some ways. And what's amazing to me is how we're figuring out how to use this, um, this, these, this technology and these moment, this moment um, to, to kind of produce another version of that. Um, and um, Kate, I don't know, it's, it strikes me as a particular challenge for somebody who's teaching theater. Um, again, given the kind of embodied side of it. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, how, if you can kind of, to me, that's a transition to you. How, how, how does this relate to what you see as a challenge as an opportunity and, and, you know, what are you doing this fall? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, every time this, uh, the language of like community and connection is coming up as we're talking, I, I sort of, I perk up because I think that's something I think about a lot. Um, I, I already think about it a lot in terms of my class and how uh, I create and, and maintain a community of the classroom. And I think initially I really felt like, uh oh, this is the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. How are we, how am I going to do that? Um, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about that over the summer and I'm definitely making that really the priority of a lot of my classes is just mm -hmm. like, how are we creating community and how are we maintaining that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of specifically tricky because I want us to do that in an embodied way and we're gonna be online. Um, so here's what I'm thinking about. Um, a lot of check-ins, just regularly checking in on my students as people, um, partly in the theater ensemble, a sense of ensemble and collaboration is really important. Um, so we really get to know each other very well. Um, that's, that'll be a really important part of um, each of my classes. Um, I've learned a lot about different mechanisms for feedback. Um, so, uh -oh. 
I've learned a lot about different mechanisms for feedback. So um, I'll be able to respond really directly to my students um, kind of questions as they're coming up or um, any challenges they, as they arise. And I'm, I'm just really prepared to be very flexible over the course of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, um, what else am I doing? Well, I guess the other thing that's really specific, I think to theater, um, I think of it as specific to theater and theater at Reed, but also theater sort of uh, more broadly is how do we create theater when we've understood it, theater to be really reliant on liveness in um, this kind of shared presence of the audience and performer. And we just cannot gather together as performers and audience right now. Um, and so this is a question that the field is really grappling with. Um, and I think in our department already before this moment, we've already been really interested in asking the question of what does theater and performance look like right now? Um, and that sort of just has some heightened resonance. Um, so we'll be asking these questions of like, how is the world of theater and performance responding to this moment? Um, what can we learn about the discipline of theater from the ways the field responds to the moment? What is essential to theater? Um, like Jerry mentioned, we get this great opportunity to bring in scholars and artists from all over the place that can zoom into our classes very easily um, mm -hmm. to really be directly in conversation with us in these mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think throughout my plan is just to embrace play and experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, one of my areas of research is experimental performance. So already contemporary performers are already thinking about experimenting with form, interrogating the very notion of what theater is and can be. So I feel very at home in that, in that milieu, as long as I have my lens on that's, that's reminding me, okay, experimentation is what we do. Play is what we do. This is a moment of opportunity. Um, and not, uh-oh, what are all these challenges? How is that going to shut down um, what we do in the class? Actually, it's so much connected to the kinds of things we do in the class. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of what we're going to be that's working great. on. Yeah, so Chris, you, on the other hand, are not teaching in an, a particularly embodied um, discipline, but you <laughs> are teaching, or, or arguably, it's not particularly playful, um, I, if I if I if I remember correctly, you're teaching a course called Politics and Elections. Is that right? <laughs> I'm, what do you see as the challenges and, and opportunities here? Um, uh, and you're also teaching hybrid, in person. You're you're doing a range of them. So let, let's hear from you. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's true. Well, the challenges associated with the electoral process. That's a different. Well, that's the class. So you can go ahead and take that if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, but as you said, right, I'm teaching two classes this semester. One of them has 48 students and the other one has 36 students. There's quite a few students in those classes in comparison to a typical read course. One of them is entirely in person. That's the economics and politics class with um, Dr. Kim, Kim Klausing here. And the other is this class on, on American government, which I teach every year. It's an introductory course, um, two sections of 24 people. At least that's what it traditionally is. And I want to, of course, echo a lot of the comments of my fellow colleagues here, which is that I think one of the major issues associated with this new world is this idea of contact. Mm -hmm. our, as you said, Tamara, our industry is, or our craft, if you want to use that word, but our industry is one where we are in the classroom, we're constantly next to students. Our ability to teach people is not just about delivering substance, but also helping them work through a series of, uh, of thought processes. And so the challenge is contact. And so from our pers my perspective, at least, the challenge is to, uh, either try to replicate the parts of the classroom experience, the in-person classroom experience that we can. So hold on to those as much as we possibly can. And then the parts of the classroom experience that we can't do in person, either to try to get close to them or to realize that actually we need to make some fundamental changes in how we're delivering education. And we've had conversations, I've had this conversation specifically with Kara um, and in a different group, but, but the idea that we want to trying to distill down to what is it, what is the essence of our in-classroom experience. And for me, it's about the students coming together and going on an educational journey, uh, mm -hmm. with each other, arguing with each other. And because we can't do that in a large environment, what I've done in my class is I've taken these sections, which are typically 24 students, and I've broken them down into nine person classes. Mm -hmm. Those are, they're going to be much smaller groups. Uh, my sense is that's uh, definitely an opportunity for students to have uh, what would otherwise be uh, a, not a large class because it's relatively small, but have a much smaller kind of tutorial experience with students. Mm -hmm. 
But as we've also discussed, um, there are other challenges associated with, um, frankly, ac access to class coursework. And so we also understand that there are students that read who are, who want to attend read who frankly don't want to come back to campus for a variety of reasons. And so I think it's one of the things I've also done in my course is to build a specific um, 12 person section that's related specifically to online students. And many of them are students who are at home or, or abroad. And I made that in, in really early in the morning so that we could capture all of the time zones basically from here um, east all the way to Europe. Mm -hmm. Try to sort of think about the ways that are kind of close to the existing college experience and look to other ways that are less constrained. Mm -hmm. The thing that I've, I've tried to do in the course is to um, so I understand that we, so I have to have these small groups, which is great because there's a lot of sort of intense learning. Nobody can sort of shirk their responsibilities in that group, but it can feel a little bit isolating. I think that's something that's going to be challenging for our students because they are going to be quite literally isolated in some cases, right? And so the other challenge is to somehow make a community of those 48 students without an American government class feel like they're part of something bigger. And what I've done this semester, which I've never done before, uh, is I've decided to create a series of um, a series of interviews of each of the individual students about, in this case, we're talking about the Federalist Papers. So each student is going to read a Federalist Paper. I've created a sheet of things that they need to answer questions about. I'm going to interview them. We're going to record it. And then we're going to create a series of podcast series that will, will be around 48 Federalist Papers. And that's going to be something that's um, uh, part of the uh, course work. And so the entire course then can listen to these kind of like this in-depth discussion about individual Federalist Papers, how they manage a certain parts of the government, the judiciary, the constitution, et cetera. And the same thing goes for another project, which is to create a, a group blog, because mm -hmm. to these two things, which I never normally do because it's, it's kind of hard to manage, but that's what we're doing now. So we can think about also what kinds of skills are our students going to need in certainly the medium term. It's, it's definitely going to be the case that they're going to need to be able to act in an online environment in ways that they didn't before. Of course, our students are incredibly adept at this kind of thing. But they're also going to be um, engaging in different kinds of experiences. Things that were traditionally in person will now likely be online. So what kind of skills can we give them or what kinds of actions can we use? Can we, what kinds of substantive areas of, of coursework can we get them to use their existing skill set on? So they might be, for example, very good at Twitter or very good at um, other kinds of social media. But how can we get them to engage in other components of, uh, of online learning or, or online discussion with, the, with new uh, areas of, of study? So there's, there's a lot of other things that I could talk about, but I think ultimately the challenge and opportunity for um, what we're doing here is not just contact, but also frankly, our ability to adapt to changing circumstances. Because I understand that throughout the semester, we're going to have to do that. And I gotta say, having worked with all of these people for the summer and well, for years now, uh, we're not that old, but for a long time, <laughs> for a long time, I can say that we're an incredibly adaptable faculty and we have worked very difficult, very hard to try to make a, mm -hmm. the best experience for your students are going to be able to. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, oh, there's so much in all of this. Um, so I, um, I think I'm gonna jump to some of the questions that have come in and, um, uh, but also my panelists, my co-panelists, if you have questions for each other, um, go ahead and let me know and we can get those in here too. Um, uh, um, one question that came in, which I think uh, speaks to the question of contact and community is a question about competition. Um, so, uh, one of the viewers asked, um, are students expected to compete with each other or is there a more collaborative um, environment um, um, in your classroom? And I think that's a, an important question um, in general to ask in part because read is, um, you know, we all, we've all heard the kind of the stress culture or um, a kind of an emphasis on rigor. And I have heard in the past a concern that this promotes a kind of um, competitiveness in the classroom um, that can be, um, that can undermine learning. So I, I'd love to hear from you, especially in this, seems like an especially, uh, especially important question in this environment where um, we don't have the same kind of access to uh, our students, ar arguably. So, um, I, you know, it's an open question to the entire panel. Um, anyone? I am so curious to hear what um, folks have to say about this because uh, that's not a, 
Um, I, I want to say in the, the theater department, we are working deeply collaboratively with each other. And, and I think collaboration is actually something that we um, teach and kind of try to train our students to become skilled at. I don't think collaboration is easy. Um, I think it's one of the hardest things to do to be deeply and truly collaborating with partners. Um, especially, I mean, I think especially for me, I think in an artistic context, but any, in any context, um, to really show up, be rigorous, um, bring your full hardcore intense self and be listening, available, ready for other people's ideas and, and mm -hmm. thinking about how how you can collaborate and incorporate those things, I think is a skill that really needs to be honed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really work on that. I think, um, and I think that rigor and collaboration can go hand in hand. I think sometimes we think about collaboration as like a kind of fuzzy, fluffy idea, um, but I think it, to do it really well, it's, it's really challenging. Um, but I haven't really encountered any um, competition mm -hmm. in my classes at all. Carrie. Mm -hmm. I would love to add to that. Um, I think that's true for studio art as well. We really teach them how to work together. And particularly, I think at Reed in general, what they're doing in classes is that because it's a Socratic method, they're learning from each other ways, new ways of thinking, new ways to think about texts. So in some senses, I've always felt like I'm a participator in this class. I'm with a new group of human beings. I'm delivering some information. Um, I'm giving them tools to be creative, but it's all about learning from each other, very much so. And in, in the instance of many of the studio classes, we really enforce them to work collaboratively, particularly with architectural projects or larger exhibitions that they'll be producing. They're doing that together, not alone. So I think, I think it's part of Reed ethos to be um, learning from one another, yeah. Yeah, I was going to add too, I think that I, I view my students as collaborators with me, right, that, that we're on this learning journey together. And sure, I think they're in the sciences, maybe, or at least in the in biology where people are doing as a, as a cell and developmental biologist, you know, development happens at weird times sometimes. And so people are kind of sometimes competitive about oh, lab until one day I was here like over the weekend. But I don't think that that kind of the, the, the desire to figure out something um, is at the expense of collaboration. And in fact, in, in my own lab, I have a, a mission statement that that's starkly says exactly what I believe in, in which it, science done well is science done in community. And, you know, we have to be our own um, critics, um, not just on our own selves, but with the people within our group. And so um, there's kind of uh, a no holds barred lab meeting every week that we have, and that's going to transition to have online components as well as in person. Um, but that's all done with the spirit of figuring things out and this rigorous inquiry. And it's also done in the spirit of kindness, right? So it's not about making people feel bad when they make mistakes, because I always say you learn from mistakes. I tell that to my five-year-old daughter. Um, I, I tell it to myself and I, I tell it to my students. And I think that um, my students, by the time they, they, they leave, they really do believe that that's the case. And I think they can, they've learned from that experience that through making those mistakes, sometimes you stumble upon discoveries that you never knew that's what you were looking for, right? By, by doing something a little bit differently or thinking about something from a different perspective. And so, so yeah, I think there's this, this balance between being competitive in our discipline to try to, to figure things out and to, to really get at the meat of the issues while doing that in a collaborative way. Um, and I think in, in terms of classes, I've talked a lot about research lab stuff, but in, in terms of classes, uh, one thing that we've started doing a couple of years ago now in the introductory biology courses is that we, we randomize lab partners. So it, it ends up allowing students um, to work with different kinds of people and different people um, so that they're not always working with the same person. Um, and they learn different ways of doing things. And there's never someone who ends up being the expert on the one thing, right? Because they're all switching around. And so even though last week your partner was really good at the statistical analysis, this week you're gonna have to step it up and be that statistical analysis person. So I think by sharing um, how people work together, 
uh, is really important. So that's one of the things. That I'm and I, I to, to use this time, um, I've also been thinking a lot, not just about um, COVID, but about the, the protests and um, ways in which we can make a more um, equitable and just society. And it's something that scientists, I think, have for a long time have been kind of kept our blinders on about. And, um, and this moment has really led our department to, to really dig deep and think about how we teach, what we teach, who we teach um, in terms of the, the scientists that we profile and the discoveries that we highlight um, mm -hmm. to really make sure that students appreciate and understand that, that anyone can do science, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a way of thinking that, that we want everyone to have access to. So, so yeah, I, I think I rambled a lot, but maybe Chris has some ideas about competition or something else. Uh, yeah, I mean, briefly. Um, first of all, I think there's a structural impediment to too much competition at Reed, and that is our grading system. And I think a lot of other places where you see a lot of competition, it's because people need A's and they know that if they don't, if somebody else gets the A, they may not or something like that. And that really is not part of the ethos here, broadly speaking. So structurally, that's very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's all um, I think it's also really professor um, dependent and in some cases subject dependent. So I, um, and tomorrow knows several faculty who might foster a more, how should we say it, academic kind of jousting environment. But of course, they don't do that from the perspective of trying to, you know, see who's going to be the best. They do that because they think that's the best way to get everybody to think. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to challenge people, they want students in the classroom to challenge each other. I think that the students themselves are their own, individual students are their own strongest competitor. If there's any comp mm -hmm. competition at the college, it's often students sort of going down wild rabbit holes. In fact, we have to kind of stop them from being competitive with themselves. Somebody asked in the chat, for example, and uh, my colleagues here have mentioned this, whether we, you know, we learn from our students, and it's certainly the case that that's true. In fact, I build in opportunities where I can learn from students. So mm -hmm. This semester I mentioned, Federalist assignment. I'm going to ask them to essentially code the Federalist papers for different kinds of items. I'm not going to do that, but they're going to do that. And I'll, I'll frankly learn for the next year which ones I should assign during what weeks. So it's definitely the case that we have a collaborative environment between faculty and students. And so there's also these structural barriers to having the kind of competitive environment that you might envision at sort of other institutions. It was a very Federalist answer to that question. Structure, structure institutions, and culture. Um, yeah, and I would, I would just add in my own teaching um, that I build in, I, I have um, assignments that are structured uh, precisely to um, depend on collaboration between students. So even in, I teach political philosophy, even in that context, uh, you know, that they're working on um, assignments together and not in a totally, um, they're not just out there in the left alone to work together, but I work really hard over the course of the semester to teach them how to collaborate together, um, both in small groups and in the classroom. And the, the result of um, that sort of assignment, this particular assignment I have in mind, it's, it is always, they're always very positive and like the students always come back to me uh, and identify those projects as the ones where they feel that they've learned the most and where I can see that they've learned the most. So um, uh, I don't wanna say that there is no competition here at Reed, of course. And, and I, I would just second Chris's observation that a lot of it is just, it's, it, it sort of, um, comes in with the individual students and and part of I see part of my job is is helping them break out of that and um, you know figure out how they how we can work together to learn uh, learn things so um, okay there was there were also a number of questions um, here actually specific questions about um, whether parents or other students would have access to um, the virtual performances uh, that that are happening in the art uh, art department and and in the theater department. Okay, with that, uh, we 
put together a session in order to work with the Division of the Arts and brainstorm how we might put together a platform that will be open to the Reed community. So in terms of how people will know about it, it'll be on at Reed in our weekly you know, newsletter. And it'll essentially be a video platform. We're not perfectly sure what the format will end up to be. They're, it's sort of in creation right now. But the hope is that each one of the classes will announce when they're going to have a performance or offer us to stream on and watch what's going on. Um, we did this last year with the thesis student exhibition, and it was essentially a video game like platform in which you could have a, kind of your, an avatar moving through this space. Um, and I imagine it'll take different forms for each one of uh, each one of us. Kate, I don't know if you want to address this <laughs> as well. Um, but in addition, the, uh, we're also inviting in creative writing for their visiting writers and also hoping that all of the people who were lecturing for our classes. So I mentioned there's a few coming for the visual arts and they will be also viewable by the public. So yes, available. <laughs> Yeah, so just to chime in there, um, I think we're in conversation about what that will look like um, and it hasn't been um, completed yet. So, um, but it, the idea is that it should be available for community to watch um, and to have access to all of the um, performances that are coming out of the arts and the performing arts. Um, and just to speak specific, there's a specific question about theater um, and how students not taking theater classes can be involved in theater performance. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. There's a couple of opportunities for students to do that. Um, you don't need to be a theater major or be taking theater classes. Um, and I'll just say that, that um, kind of speaking to this question of like Chris's point about adaptability and how we need to be really adaptable and flexible to this current moment. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we are adapting in terms of our productions. So typically we have a fall main stage production. We do plays on a stage most often with a live audience. Um, and this semester we'll be doing um, Ionesco's Rhinoceros, um, but in a three parts. So we'll do it serially. So each act will have its own, um, own kind of production and each um, installation will be in a different medium. Um, so I'm not working directly on that project. My colleagues are working on it. So I can't speak with specificity, but I know that that one portion of it will involve a kind of a graphic novel approach um, mm -hmm. to that production. Others will have a live component. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty exciting. Again, just kind of thinking about experimentation, what's possible with the form. Um, mm -hmm. We have a group of students uh, who lead a student led production, um, all student generated material um, that I'm working directly with. And I'm really excited to see what they're gonna come up with. Um, I imagine experimenting with podcasts, experimenting mm -hmm. with like live Zoom interactive performances. Um, so who knows what we're gonna do. Um, the plan is to have that available through this, um, this portal that Jerry was talking about. Super cool. Uh, um, Kara, there was a question about um, how you're gonna, can, if you could say a little bit more about how students um, remote and in person will be working on their bio labs. Right. Yeah. So this is something that we've given a lot of thought to. And in, in fact, we had several departments that were devoted just to this one topic about how to do biology remotely. And um, one, one of the things that we thought about were, well, what, what aspects does, can you do remotely? Do you not need to be in the lab? And so some of that comes down to figuring out um, new methods and or applying existing methods for data analysis. And so being much more didactic in how we teach and um, encourage students to be a little bit more creative and or playful with data analysis, trying out lots of different ways instead of just saying, okay, for this kind of test, you've got um, a dependent and independent variable analysis are you going to you know sort of having them sketch it out what kind of visual to um, use and you know having them think a little bit more graphically um, is one one approach but that's not the only approach um, we're also having students so some of our ecologists um, have designed activities and experiments for students to conduct on their own um, so they send them the handout um, and then the students are responsible for going out 
uh, collecting the materials that they need out in the wherever they are. And so you can imagine that so one of my colleagues studies uh, aquatic environments. And so people are going to be collecting samples from lakes or rivers or streams or oceans. And the, the diversity of samples that he's going to have in his class is phenomenal this year, as opposed to every year when they go out and collect samples from the canyon, which is also rural and really but this brings a whole level of diversity um, to what students are going to be studying. But it also allows students to highlight that you can use the same methods and techniques to study and, and even ask a similar question in varied environments. Mm -hmm. um, we've also focused on types of uh, that students may could even do virtually. So there's a lot of things that we do on a molecular biology level that um, we do on a computer, right? So I design DNA fragments. Um, I really do what I call in silico cloning to make sure everything I'm, I'm designing is gonna work out correctly. Um, and so students are doing a lot of that um, on their own. And then once they've designed those components then they submit those. And then um, I think in one class they're doing some of the remote students who are doing some of the primer and um, DNA design and then the in-person students are actually testing the reagents and so kind of like this nice collaboration back and forth across time and space that way. Um, one of the introductory level courses um, has a focus on genomics and bioinformatics. All of that can be done on a computer so you don't need to be in a lab for that so that's uh, another way that we're thinking about which aspects of what we do can be um, remote. So yeah so um, the other thing that I would add, so what I do is really hard to do remotely. You need um, a pretty fancy microscope and some, some fish embryos. And so um, what students are doing for, for my section of intro bio, where we study a variety of different organisms, I've actually done all the experiments this summer and collected data sets and also videotaped myself doing the experiments with the help of a colleague. Um, and so for students who maybe have to quarantine for a short amount of time or who can't be there in person for the lab, those materials will be available as well. Amazing. Um, thanks. So um, there's a question here about the nuclear reactor, if it's available for, available for students during COVID. Um, does anyone know the answer to that question? I know we just hired a new director of the reactor. Um, so my assumption is yes. Kara? Yeah, so my understanding is yes, that it will be available for students um, and that they're, they're modifying their training protocols. Um, and I mean, I think one of the things in the sciences that we've thought a lot about is how you maintain safety in the lab. I always give this speech to my students about never work alone in the lab because there's lots of things that can happen to you. Um, and, and the same thing goes with the reactor. And so they put, again, protocols in place so that you can still have sort of the minimum number of students and, and supervisors around, uh, but not large crowds. Yeah, good, okay, thanks. So we only have a, a little bit more time, but one of the questions that I've heard um, that didn't come up here in the chat, but I've heard uh, in various um, venues over the summer is how are we managing uh, how are we going to address the fact that pretty much everybody is operating under um, a, a higher level of um, anxiety than normally um, is the case, given this very strange and rapidly changing um, world we're inhabiting at the moment. So. Um, I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts about how they are sort of incorporating that reality into their teaching and um, the semester, if, if they are, if you are. Well, I have so, some, go ahead. oh, I have so many thoughts about that. Great, you have, you have a few minutes. I'll go and then you go, Kara. Um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I think it connects to my um, considerations of community in the classroom. Um, how am I going to address it directly and right away and regularly throughout the semester? Mm -hmm. um, I think through sharing my own experience and just being really transparent about my own um, stressors and the ways in which I manage those, 
um, to giving space for students to express theirs, to being available in office hours, to talking about that. Um, but also I think just the way that I've retooled my class in ways that I will continue at, you know, in the future um, to provide different kinds of opportunities for students to engage the classroom. Um, it, so like asynchronous discussion forums, for example, I think um, can be, I can imagine that as being a really useful tool. Um, if you are not in a place where you're ready to, to, to be a super active participant in a synchronous discussion. Um, as, a, as, a, as your professor, I want to see you engaging in the class um, and I'm allowing students to have a, a couple of different ways that they can, they can do that. And so if I see you actively engaging in the asynchronous forum, great. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not as active and synchronous, that's okay with me. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kate. Kara? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Kate said. I think being um, direct and transparent about the fact that we all are under a lot of stress and different kinds of stress than we probably have been in the past mm -hmm. um, is, is the important thing. I was going to say that I, I approach this with, you know, from the place that I would want someone to approach it with me, and that's from a place of empathy and being able to think about um, and put myself in a position where students feel like they can can come in and share something that they need to share, but also um, setting up structures in my classes and in my lab so that um, it's really easy to communicate. So in our lab, we have, um, we use the Slack channels to, to communicate with each other about how things are going on, who's going to be in lab, when um, if happens to someone, you know, if someone was in a test and it was turned violent, whatever, those kinds of things. We, it's just a way of keeping in touch with students and checking in on them. Um, in my classes, one of the things that I've done is, is like Kate, I've designed a variety of different activities for students to engage with, and I've also given them some choice. So instead of just saying everyone has to, for this, for these five labs, you have to turn in a lab report that looks like this, I've said for these five labs, you have to turn in four lab reports. One of them needs to have this aspect. Another one needs to focus on this. And so um, giving them choice and say, okay, well, this one, you know, I'm just going to work on the abstract. That's one of the things I can take off and I can do that. I know how to do that. Or likewise, I'm going to choose to do the data analysis part because that part I can do and I can kind of compartmentalize for, for the time being. Um, I think those are really, actually really good pedagogical things to do regardless. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that it's taken something so dramatic for us to really think really hard about you know, giving our students more um, agency, at least, at least um, in the biology classes. I think we're, we're, we're really embracing that. I would just add to that, that that's something that I heard a lot of our colleagues talking about, of giving them a lot of choices and how they might respond. So maybe there's three papers written out and two podcasts or something more community driven. Um, and I'm certainly engaging with that. I'm also, I'm lucky to be teaching in the arts because process is so much a bit, so much a part of what you make. <laughs> so they often think about the end goal and I don't really want to see the end goal only, but all of the steps along the way. So kind of, you know, the rough drafts, that is what they'll be turning in. And I'm also, you know, giving them a pass in a way that if you can't get it done to your absolute apex that you normally would, what would be okay for you to be turning in at this time? Um, I, I imagine that we'll all have to be very creative in this semester. Um, some of us might get sick at some point. <laughs> some of the students just might not be able to handle the kind of stress that's coming at them from different points of view. So again, you know, I think a lot of us have had the discussion that day one, we're going to make sure that empathy is a really big part of our classes, that we have the discussion and we've already set up kind of the standards of how you'll be responding to this that's reasonable for them. So, yeah. Chris, can I, I just jump in and I just want, oh, sorry. I already said a thing, but I wanted to jump in and on something that Kara said that I feel like is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just about, um, you said something Kara about, um, strategies that you're using and sort of wondering why did it take this mm -hmm. moment to really mm -hmm. um, get you to start doing those strategies. And I've really been reflecting on that myself. Mm -hmm. I would toot my own horn to say that I feel like I'm a pretty good professor. Um, and I went in to completely redesign my classes, all of my classes, classes I've taught a bunch um, mm -hmm. this 
summer and in in looking at them and taking them apart and putting them back together again and thinking about retooling for this new context, I learned so many things and I, I've adjusted so many things that I know are going to make my classes better mm -hmm. going forward. Um, and I've been wondering the same thing, but, but regardless, I think mm -hmm. it's great that all, that, uh, to know that, that a lot of the strategies I'm gonna be using that help in this mm -hmm. um, synchronous, asynchronous online mm -hmm. context are, are really things that I'm gonna be using moving forward. And I think are really beneficial to a wide variety of students. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a very similar feeling. Um, um, well, unfortunately we're kind of coming to the end of the hour, but I, um, the, the last question that I wanted to toss out uh, uh, is uh, to ask if anyone had heard, if there's something that one of you has heard from about what other colleagues are doing um, that you think um, folks might be interested in hearing about. Because a number of, um, we, we've all been working with colleagues this summer in getting ready for this fall and um, there's some amazing ideas out there and I just thought I'd give us, invite the opportunity to hear um, if, if folks had any that stood I'll out to them. Start briefly. Um, I know Jerry already, Jerry knows the entire art department and division for that matter. Um, she seems to have a good list. I'm just thinking about our colleague Tamara Peter Steinberger, who has been teaching at the college for a very long time. In fact, uh, longer than I've been alive. Uh, and he has a very a particular, and you should tell him that, uh, has a particular way of, um, of teaching. He's very good at it. His the people wait for years to take one of his classes. Um, and he's the kind of person that you would worry about the transition to an online format. And I got to say, he, he like, he was very resistant for like a minute and then he just went full on into it. And so his way of dealing with it in the fall is going to be to teach a class. He has got 24 students always, and he'll teach a class where 12 students are there one day and 12 students are remote. And then they'll, that'll be, that'll be flipped. And then during that discussion, um, he's going to have, 20 minute chunks or half hour chunks, some amount of time of chunks where the in-person people are, in, are interacting with each other and then where the remote folks are gonna be interacting with each other and each, every, each group is going to be able to see the other. It sounds honestly like it's the Super Bowl halftime show to me, much more challenging than that sort of thing. Um, or the DNC, not the RNC, that's not going very well, but the DNC sort of uh, tour around America. But I mean, again, Peter Steinberger at 71 years old is like embracing it, going full on, and the experience um, is going to be pretty similar to what uh, you might have gotten maybe in 1984. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was good in 1984. And it's, as you said, students line up out the door for those classes. So uh, yeah, there was there one other, Jerry, did, were you going to? Uh, I just know that uh, Katja Garloff is teaching a film theory class and uh, with Monica and they are going to be having the students screen the films together and then gather at right afterwards. So, you know, the discussion can really happen um, while they're watching the films together. And uh, also in art history class that they're uh, designing an exhibition. So there'll be real time with the curator in the gallery. They'll be on Zoom, but the curator will be watching them through what's in the exhibition what's in the collection and then they'll be able to access that entire collection in our digital archive we have a digital resource center at reed so i was just really impressed yeah. i've been talking to a lot of colleagues and it's all really impressive yeah everybody's I, taking it super seriously <laughs> i agree i mean um you know as, as these folks know um i headed up a committee this summer of faculty who were then helping other faculty. Many of, of folks here were on that committee. And we just again and again, I was blown away by both the, the energy and the creativity and the attention that um, that folks put into this, uh, this opportunity that we're, we're faced with. So, um, uh, yeah, we- can yes. I say something real quickly? Sorry. I just, so one of the things I wanted to highlight that we haven't talked about at all really is that, um, and maybe this is just from, I think from the, the arts and also in the sciences, we have a number of staff people who make our lives possible. And I've been so impressed with some of the instrumentation biologists 
physicists and, and chemists. And we also have this machine shop in physics um, that has a 3D printer and a mm -hmm. laser cutter. And um, Jay Ewing, who runs that shop, has been working full tilt this whole summer um, printing um, little like attachments that you can put on your, your phone to make little microscopes, um, making parts to build a spectrophotometer for, for chemistry students, um, basically collating all of this equipment for physics students. And so um, it's not just faculty who have been working really hard and who want students to have the, the best experience yeah. possible. I think the Reed community has really turned up and turned out for this. Um, and I think it's really a testament to Reed as this special community of, of people feeling like we're all in this together and we're going to make the best experience we can. Totally. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I, I, I would second that. And uh, yeah. yeah, so um, we, uh, let's see, I'm supposed to remind you that you can um, email me questions if you have any at read, what is it, readctl at read.edu. It's a little redundant. Um, uh, but, and uh, I just want to thank the panelists for your, your insight um, and your ideas. And um, thanks to the attendees who I can see in your numbers. I can't see your faces, but thanks. And thanks for entrusting um, us with your, your children or your, your people. We're, we're excited to um, have the opportunity to teach and learn with them. So uh, have uh, good luck with the fall, folks, and uh, I'll see you in the future. Thanks.